first of all, some civil military relations has to do with the relationship between the government, like our political leadership, the people, and the military. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, my main interest lately has been the importance of that in maintaining democracy. And uh, a lot of this has to do with understanding what the norms are of civil military relations. But that also has to do with understanding what the norms are in, the, in, your, in your democratic system in the first place. So there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, recent books and articles and just a lot of discussion going on, not just the United States, but in, in Western democracies in general, that there's been sort of an erosion of, of liberal Western democracy. And so uh, I think we should all be very concerned about that. And so I think the simple solution is that we must be very familiar with our democratic institutions. And because the research shows when democracies die in you know, other countries and throughout history, it has to do with an eroding of these institutions and an eroding of the people's attachment to the institutions. And some of this can almost be unwitting because over time we forget you know, our own origins. So I think you know, a lot of people have heard about you know, we need more civic education and you know, things like that and how little the average American even knows about their own system. So I think we're all sort of victims of that. And so I've been advocating you know, here at the War College that it's very important for the military, uh, the, the professional military, to understand the military's role in a democracy. And of course, the military uh, officer takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution. So that means they take an oath to support and defend a process, not a person, it's not to the president or even to the nation in some nebulous concept of what's the nation or the state, it's to the Constitution. So that means um, we must understand these democratic institutions and certainly do nothing to undermine them. So the first step is to go back to those origins and if you look at the Constitution, you could read it as a national security document because the founders were so concerned, first of all, with the role of the military. You know, they didn't want a standing army. They were very, you know, one of their reasons for revolting against Great Britain was, you know, we had British soldiers quartered in colonial homes and things like that. So they were very concerned about that. And so you could look at the Constitution and the separation of powers. It's a lot of checks and balances, you know, not just within our own institutions, but also power over the military, you know, so if there's separate separation of powers, we've got the Congress and we've got the President, we have all of this, this split power. Um, so that's a, a foundational concept that we don't want to lose track of. And then fast forwarding to how does that play into understanding democratic civil military relations norms. So the main one would be that the military should be apolitical. Well, that sounds really simple, you know, like, we don't take over the government. I think we know that. That's infused in our professional norms. But it's actually a lot more nuanced because the military has a lot of power in the United States in general because it's such a prestigious institution. And it gets more complicated by the fact that we have what observers have been calling a civil military gap. And that is um, there's literally a gap between the uh, civilians, population, the military, and the and going back to those three sides of that civil military relations triangle, mainly due to the all-volunteer force, you know, back almost about 46, 47 years now, back in 1973, so approaching 50 years of an all-volunteer force where, you know, fewer and fewer Americans serve. And most disturbingly now in post 9-11, there's this attitude that other people do this that we've got this professional military, it's not an obligation of citizenship, people will sign up and do it, but it's not the responsibility of an average citizen. And the gap also means that people aren't paying much attention to this institution, um, to include even Congress and congressional oversight for wars and things like that. So this all kind of all, all goes back, um, this feeds into the norms, because when you have this context of a civil military gap, then you don't have as much interest in what in national security things in general, of what the military is doing. You don't have great oversight of wars. 
which is one of the reasons why I think our post-9-11 wars have dragged on and on and on. And you have people kind of fuzzy with what we mean about the apolitical norm. So yes, we know we don't take over the government, but it also means that the military should not be too influential in policy. So, and that's tough in a civil mill gap because the military has a monopoly on information that's critical to national security. Um, and, and it's again very prestigious and the population is inclined to defer to the military. That includes the political leadership and the civilians at large. And I was just at a international studies conference like a week ago and there was some recent research that was presented on this that when, when polled Americans are asked you know which of these actors do you trust? And one of the actors they were asked about was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And then they asked, well, in what areas do you trust, um, you, do you trust him more than anybody else? And they answered, really, in any area. Didn't matter if it was a national security domain or not. So I think in general, in Western liberal democracies, we have this trend of populism, uh, rising populism, nationalism, and a deference, um, in our case, to the military institution, which can be, you know, not a good combination if we're not careful. So this goes back, so I go back to the solution is the population needs to care about their democratic institutions. They need to recognize when the norms are being eroded, which means they must understand what the norms are. And I think we all have work to do in that. So my emphasis here at the War College is I've been trying to you know, through my elective and through the, the core teaching, you know, do our bit at the War College to impress on the military profession what the norms of the profession are. And, you know, to obviously civilian control, but to not overplay their hand, but also not to underplay their hand in terms of their professional responsibility uh, to the society and within this context of the civil military gap where we do need our military expertise to feed into the strategy and all these decisions that our political leadership has the responsibility to make. Um, but there are ways that the military could be over influential in that process if you know they chose to be or um, if they could be manipulated by outside actors who seek the political gain of getting a military voice to sign up for a particular policy outcome or things like that. And of course, there's all this partisanship um, trend as well with mainly retired officers and retired general officers getting involved in endorsing camp, um, presidential candidates and things like that. But they've also been getting more and more involved with giving their preferences for different policy choices. So there's a lot of sort of trends out there and I think it's important that we kind of stick to the basics and, you know, love our institutions and understand that we've got two co-equal branches and a free press is important and all these things are important. And that any slippage anywhere is a threat to our checks and balances and sort of healthy, balanced civil military relations is a little subset of all of that and, and is an important element in maintaining our democracy overall.